Okay, so this is what a generic for loop looks like. There are three different iterator functions that come supplied with the Lua interpreter. The first one we're going to discuss is called next. And unlike a normal function, you don't really call a iterator function. The actual for loop calls the iterator function for you. So as you can see here, you've got next, and it doesn't have parentheses like you think it would, like this. You just place a comma right after it. So when you first look at this, the first thing you're probably going to realize and note down is that there's a new keyword. It's called in. Basically, what it means is that this uh, iterator function on the right hand side of in, that's a function like any normal function, and it's going to return some output using the return keyword like you usually would see with a normal function. For example, here is an iterator function I just created and just to note down, this isn't what an actual proper iterator function would look like inside the body of code, I'm just using it as a test. So it's going to call the iterator function and return hello and 1234 and these are going to be stored in the key and value variables that are waiting outside of the function to catch it. It just looks a bit different because that's how a for loop sort of sets itself up between the for and do keywords. So the next iterator function is going to look into the table, the TBL table, and it's going to harvest some information and store it in key and value. And then we could be able to print it. So what a iterator function does is that it iterates through all the key and value pairs in the entire table and stores them into variables. The next iterator function iterates through the index part of the table as well as the hash table. However, iterator functions handle things pretty differently than what you'd probably expect when it comes to the hash table. Every iterator function usually prints the index part of the table first and then the hash table because the index part of the table is in the, the first half of the table and then the hash table always follows after the index parts as I've probably explained before in the tables episode. The only problem is, is that you probably want it to print out hash value 1 with the value 100, then hash value 2 with 200 in a chronological order going downwards like this. However, it doesn't know the order. I think it sort of just manipulates data in its memory and stores it how it sees fit in the memory. And because of this, you never know what values are going to come out. Most of the time, they're not in the order that you'd expect. So let's just run this now and see exactly what it's printing. So you can see just here, it's going to loop this body of code and print key and concatenate it with this colon and then concatenate it again with the value. And there's the output. As you can see, like I said, it will do the index part of the table first. Because it's 1, 2, 3 and 4, it kind of knows the order it's going to print it out as. So luckily, this is all sorted in the right order and it always will be. However, like I said, the hash table is always in the wrong order. So it's printed out hash value 3 with the value 300 and as we can see just here that was not the first value that we entered. Unfortunately you can't really change this, hash tables are never sorted in order by default. If you wanted anything in order, you have to put it in the index part of the table. So there are two other iterator functions that come supplied with the Lua interpreter. Just like print, it's like blue, so we know it's a Lua function and if you put i pairs you can see just there, it just changed to light blue. There is another one we're going to be discussing, which is just to remove the i, and that one's called pairs. The i pairs function actually just prints the index part of the table. So if you don't want the hash table, put an i in front of it. Just think of i representing index. If you remove the i, and you use the pairs iterator function, this is essentially exactly the same thing as next. However, there is a major difference. Both the i pairs and pairs do not use a comma. Instead, you have to call the function explicitly by using the parentheses, like this. Now, this looks much nicer. This is the sort of thing you'd probably expect to see anyway. It might have thrown you off if you saw a comma after the next, because it's a function, and functions are supposed to be called. So this looks a lot nicer, and now it's just basically calling it and placing the values in key and value, just like the next did. But the reason for this change, why pairs and i pairs use parentheses like this, rather than a comma, space, and then the table name, is because of how they're implemented. So basically, I'll explain this because it's pretty important to note down. First of all, I'll just execute this and show you that the output is exactly the same as the next iterator function. 
So iterator functions don't have to be called from within a generic for loop. You can actually use them without the for loop. The next function is actually much more simpler to use out of a generic for loop because it returns the key and value pairs. Let me just demonstrate that right now. So if you executed print next tbl, this is what it will output. So it's printed one and hello, this is the first value in a table. If we try to run the same code again, it's gonna print out the same thing. This is a nice way to check whether a table has any sort of hash values or any values whatsoever. There's not really much use for it. If, however, we supplied it with a second value, two, it would print out three and 40. This is because this is the third value. The second parameter is actually the starting point. It's basically saying what is the next value of the index value I'm gonna supply. So if you put in two, it's gonna print out the next value, which is the third value. So you have some uses for it. However, the pairs function, instead it returns a function. It's kind of strange how it works, but this is the reason why you can use parentheses rather than a comma and just the table because it actually returns another iterator function and it's pretty strange how it works. We're not really gonna think too far into this, but I'm just explaining the difference between next and pairs. There is one big difference and pairs usually is better left for a generic for loop and never use outside. For instance, the code's just here, this is an example of what it's actually doing behind the scenes. You supply it with a table and it's gonna return the iterator function, the table itself again, and the ID. And then you can use the ID again in the iterator function and get more values and it, that's how you iterate through it. And you'd never do this and set this up in this bizarre way outside of a for loop. So for instance, if I did execute this, it's gonna actually return the second value pair, so it's probably gonna return two and 50, I think. I haven't actually tested this out. But the first time we call it, that's gonna return the first key and value pairs, and then doing it again is gonna call the second one. And because we haven't printed out the first key and value pairs, and we've only printed out the second, I'm pretty sure it's gonna print two and 50. So as you can see just there, it's printed out two and 50, just like we was expecting. So even though this code looks really horrible, that's just demonstrating exactly what the pairs function is doing. It returns a function, the table, the ID, and then you have to keep doing this horrible stuff in order to get your values out. So as you can see, the next function is a lot more simpler to use if you're using it outside of a generic for loop. So really what this line here is doing, it's returning the iterator function which we actually need to be using. So you can think of this as replacing pairs and a table in the parentheses with this. So that's actually what it's looking like. Now this looks a lot more familiar. You can see here that the function is ended by a comma. And now in the original example, you had this iterator function was called next, and you had the table. The last thing we'll mention is the i pairs, and delete this horrible block of codes just here. So i pairs, again, works in the same way as pairs, apart from it does the index part of the table. You have to supply it with parentheses like this, because it's gonna return the iterator function. This isn't the true iterator function. So th what this is actually gonna do is print out the index part. That's why usually I change the variable name key to ID, because it just makes more sense. And now let's run this. So as you can see here, it's printed one to six with the values that are associated with the index part or the keys. It doesn't really matter what you wanna call it, but the important thing is that the hash table is ignored. So that pretty much covers it for for loops. If you have any questions about them, then please let me know. The only things that I'm quickly gonna cover now is just while loops. So this is pretty much what a while syntax looks like for a while loop. It's really simple. Just like the for loop, you have do and end, and anything between here gets executed. And it basically terminates when the statement, this condition, evaluates the false. So while true, you know, do this. It's pretty simple. So if I entered some code here, print is gonna execute forever because that's never gonna become false. So this executes forever and ever and ever and you wanna avoid this. A better thing to do is set a while loop in a way that it can terminate, otherwise you're gonna crash the World of Warcraft client again. Now this is basically the same as the for loops we've seen earlier. So it's gonna print out i, which is gonna be one, then it's gonna go all the way up to 10 and as soon as it becomes 11, this statement here becomes false, just like an if statement. So let's execute this and see what it prints. Okay, so it's printed one all the way to 11 this time. That's because we've got, we're increasing i by one inside the actual while loop. 
So when i is 10, this statement is still true and then it's going to increment it to 11 and print 11. Now in other languages, you can actually reverse this. You can make it sure that it executes at least once. If this condition was false, it's still going to execute it if you did something that I'm going to show you in a minute. So what I have just here is incorrect. This will cause a Lua error as we're going to see right now. Okay, do expected near end. So in other languages, something similar to this would be correct. But this is the only difference in Lua compared to other languages, which is why I think it's worth talking about. Instead of this, you have the repeat until. So you have here, repeat until. These are two new keywords, and you don't have to follow them with an end. There's no end here. It's just basically going to repeat this once, and then it's, it's going to evaluate this. And if i is less than 10, it's going to repeat it again. But this means you're guaranteed to execute this block of code at least once while it's executing in a linear fashion. So if this was false, it's still going to you know actually execute it because the condition is at the end rather than before. Okay, so that pretty much wraps it up. The main difference between Lua and other languages, however, there's a few more things which I'm quickly just going to mention. Number one, there's no switch and case statements. If you've ever seen JavaScript, for instance, you have a switch and it basically tells you which case of code to execute. That's not in Lua. The next big thing is that there's no continue statement. For loops, usually have a continue which say if this condition is met continue and skip everything else and go on to the next iteration you can't skip through code in a for loop except from using if statements you still have the break statement however so this is what a for loop looks like using the break keyword basically what this means as soon as this if statement here evaluates to true so i does indeed equal five then it's going to break and anything after this in the for loop is going to be ignored so it's going to break instantly and not bother executing anything else in the for loop. So this is basically going to print 1 to 4. And as soon as i becomes 5, it's going to break, ignore this line, and continue executing the rest of the code and escape the for loop early. So as you can see here, it's printed 1 to 4. That's exactly how we would imagine it would. And then that's it. That's all the loops covered. There's no more. So thank you very much for watching my series and I hope to see you next episode when we talk more about XML and frames and widgets and textures and all that really good stuff that you've probably been waiting for. So until next time, this has been Mayron and bye for now.